Hello everyone, welcome back to History 3560, American Military History 1. In this video, we're going to discuss warfare in pre-Columbian America, that is, amongst Native American societies before the arrival of Europeans. We'll discuss some of the ways of warfare of certain Native American groups and societies. We'll talk about the North American Woodland Societies, some of which inhabited what is now present-day Ohio. Uh, we'll talk about some of the warfare between the people of the Great Plains and the North American Southwest. And then we'll finish our discussion of pre-Columbian Native American warfare by discussing the war fighting of the people of the southeastern United States, what would become the southeastern United States, and then the tactics and technology used by the people of Mesoamerica. After this, we'll shift gears and we'll discuss the European military revolution, which took place from about the 1300s to the 1500s of the Common Era. Specifically, we'll talk about some of the military technologies that were developed during this period and what caused these technological innovations, um, both internal and external factors in Europe. Finally, we'll conclude the video by discussing the Spanish conquest of Mexico and how Native American ways of war met with European ways of war. Native American ways of war were incredibly diverse, varying significantly based on time, region, and people group. But there are certain commonalities that can be observed across time, space, and across people groups. First of all, warfare was an important part of Native American life ways. Um, these societies engaged in warfare with each other before the arrival of Europeans. Um, for many years, people did not like to talk about warfare in pre-Columbian America. Um, there's a lot of reasons for why, why that was. Unfortunately, some reasons were motivated by things like racial prejudice. There was a desire to portray Native Americans as what was often called the noble savage stereotype that the indigenous people of the Americas lived a charmed Eden-like existence and that they did not face any problems or challenges and that therefore they did not have rights to the lands on which they lived because they had not fought enough for them or struggled enough for them. Um, more recent scholarship of course has moved away from this and, and archaeological research and discoveries have found that warfare was common throughout um, pre-Columbian American societies and it just changed somewhat and varied based on, as I mentioned before, region, time, and people group. Um, as far as the differences go between Native American societies and how they approached war, um, size of armed forces varied, level of professionalization of armed forces would vary as well, um, some societies would fight larger battles with larger militaries. Other societies preferred smaller raids. Um, some of the rituals and beliefs around warfare would vary also. Um, as far as commonalities go, um, there was a great pluralism in terms of the weapons and tactics used. Some Native American societies preferred melee weapons. Others preferred ranged weapons like bows and arrows or throwing spears. Um, some societies preferred more decisive conflicts, others preferred smaller conflicts. And once again, there are certain rituals and spiritual beliefs around warfare, but these spiritual beliefs could vary. Here's a simple map illustrating some of the regions we'll be talking about in our discussion of Native American warfare. This map is fairly simple 
it does not show the uh, highly diverse ethno-linguistic groups that lived across uh, North America before the arrival of Europeans. Um, in this video, we're going to discuss a few of these regions. We're going to discuss the Northeast first and some of the Eastern woodland pe peoples. Then we'll discuss the Southwest and the Great Plains or where these regions come together and how the people of these two regions um, fought each other for a variety of reasons. Um, after that, we'll discuss warfare in the Southeast and in Mesoamerica. And these societies were much larger and they were able to devote a lot more resources to warfare. And we'll discuss what the increased resource surpluses uh, did to warfare in these societies. We'll start by talking about warfare in the northeastern woodlands, covering what is roughly the northeastern United States, as well as the northern Midwest, including uh, what is now the state of Ohio. Archaeological evidence suggests that warfare became more violent as technology improved in the northeastern woodlands. Um, early on, these societies in the northeastern woodlands used spear throwing from a device called an atlatl. Um, atlatls could throw spears and it could be used for hunting and they could be used for warfare, but they were not nearly as powerful as bows and arrows. They were also much more difficult to use. These societies uh, made blades for their spears and their arrowheads from flint and different types of stone. Um, these blades could be very deadly and they were very sophisticated, the um, skills needed to create them. These were not primitive in the true sense of the word. Um, it appears that warfare caused social change in the northeastern woodlands. It led more peaceful cultures like the Hopewell to fall apart. In, in place of them came more militaristic cultures like the Fort Ancient culture. Um, these changes took place um, from about 200 BCE up till about 1000 CE. Some scholars believe that the Fort Ancient culture were the ancestors of modern Native American peoples like the Shawnee. Highlighting their more peaceful culture, the Hopewell built a series of earthworks that were constructed for ceremonial purposes across what is now the state of Ohio, the most famous of which is um, in Newark, Ohio, a short drive from the Ohio State University Newark campus. It's actually on a golf course, or rather a golf course has been built over it. But it is a, it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site um, that is internationally known and uh, can be visited twice a year. Um, when the golf course is closed for tours of the earthworks. The Fort Ancient culture would build mounds as well, but their mounds were not built for ceremonial purposes, but for defensive purposes. Here is a uh, diagram of the Newark earthworks, highlighting its ceremonial purpose, not its military purpose. It's believed it was used to measure um, the place of the moon in the sky and that the site was probably not occupied year round, but during certain points of the year when the Hopewell culture would meet at the site to measure the moon and its place in the, in the night sky. The Fort Ancient culture built earthworks as well, but for different reasons in the Hopewell. Um, these earthworks would have been fortifications, hence the culture's name, Fort Ancient. They probably did not call themselves the Fort Ancient. This is a name that they've been given by scholars. The same with the Hopewell. We don't know what the Hopewell originally called themselves. Hopewell um, is the name they were given by 19th and 20th century um, Euro-American scholars. The Fort Ancient would have used um, strong points of fortifications to defend their corn or maize granaries and to defend their settlements. Um, these 
fortifications would have provided protection against uh, more powerful bows and arrows as well. Here are some modern recreations of Fort Ancient settlements. As you can see, they often built mounds on which they uh, built their communities, and then they would surround their homes with walls, uh, as you can see on the back end of this image, and then in this uh, 21st century uh, recreation of a Fort Ancient settlement. Um, being on a hillside would have allowed the Fort Ancient people to see their enemies coming from a further distance. It also would have made assaulting their settlements more challenging. And these walls, these wooden walls, would have provided some protection against um, arrows launched from attackers. Here are some archaeological uh, finds that are examples of the weapons used by the Fort Ancient culture. Um, bows and arrows, of course, um, were, were used to great effect. We also know that they made blades out of flint and other types of stone. These could, of course, be used as knives or as axe heads, or they could be embedded into clubs to make the clubs more deadly. New weapons technology caused warfare in the northeastern woodlands to change significantly. Um, what we think is that warfare became more common over time. Um, we also think that warfare was probably seasonal, happening mostly in the summer, um, not during the spring planting, and then not during the winter um, when the weather was colder and when there would have been a lack of foliage on the trees, which would have made um, advancing enemy armies much more visible it would have prevented um, stealth and the element of surprise uh, for an attacking force. Um, war parties were probably fairly small compared to some of the other societies we're going to discuss in this video. Um, raids were probably preferred, raids to capture supplies. Um, decisive conflicts would have been avoided just because of how destructive they could be. Um, Really, the casus belli for these uh, northeastern woodland societies would have been the capture of resources, things like corn, um, but also humans, uh, captives. Captured children and women would be adopted into uh, the victorious tribe or community. Uh, military may age males who were captured, however, they would be executed in elaborate rituals, uh, which included torture. Uh, mutilation, burning at the stake, and often after the captured warrior had died, um, the ritual consumption of his flesh. Uh, these executions would have offered uh, northeastern woodland communities a sense of retribution for warriors they'd lost in battle. It also would have given them the chance to absorb the spiritual, martial en energy of captured warriors. And then for the captured warriors uh, themselves, it would have given them a final chance to demonstrate their courage, um, courage even in the face of a very grisly death. As, as historians, it's important to consider the past and not to be judgmental. We look at things like this and it seems terrible to us today, but um, these rituals would have played an important and meaningful role in these societies. And of course, we'll discuss a lot of other violence very similar to this throughout the course. Um, it's believed that this warfare between Northeastern Native American societies became more destructive after European contact as um, tribes in the region gained access to gunpowder and steel weapons. So you see the common trend throughout military history that with increased technology becomes increased violence in warfare. Or at least the potential for increased violence. Here are some additional images of arms and equipment used by Northeastern woodland societies in warfare. Uh, you can see bows and arrows are important. But you also see that there are uh, other types of weapons, namely uh, axes um, with various types of stone tips. 
These axes could be used as melee weapons, like hatchets, or they could be thrown, like tomahawks. Um, knives were also used, as seen at the bottom of this slide. But one weapon that was very interesting and uh, very effective amongst the northeastern woodlands people were wooden clubs, like the one shown at the uh, left-hand side of the slide. The clubs were easy to hold and easy to wield, and they had a rounded um, tip, which could be used to strike the heads of uh, enemies. And these clubs were very powerful, and it's believed they could be used to crush an opponent's skull. So these weapons are very formidable. Um, they're not weak or primitive, as um, some might want to think, um, looking at them from, say, a Eurocentric perspective. Northeastern woodlands peoples may have also used canoes in warfare as well um, to traverse long distances more easily, to carry uh, military supplies and arms and equipment as well. Um, two kinds of canoes would have been used in the northeastern woodlands. Uh, birch bark canoes made of the bark from birch trees and then dugout canoes which were made from uh, logs that had been hollowed out with fires. Um, Generally, you see that birch bark canoes were used further to the north in the northeast, and then further to the south from Pennsylvania southward, roughly, what is now Pennsylvania, dugout canoes become more common. Um, essentially, these canoes were the navies of the um, northeastern woodlands peoples in pre-Columbian times. Now we'll turn our attention to the Great Plains and the Southwest and how the people of these two cultures, or regions rather, interacted with each other and how they fought their wars. Similar to the Fort Ancient people of the Eastern Woodlands, uh, the indigenous peoples of the North American Southwest built fortified settlements as well. Um, two of the most notable examples we're going to talk about um, in this video are uh, Chaco Canyon, which is in what is now New Mexico, and Mesa Verde, which is now Colorado. From about the 1500s BCE to about the 1100s CE, um, Native Americans in the North American Southwest, what are often called the Ancestral Puebloans, uh, built settlements around canyon walls and hillsides. Um, they used the environment to their advantage. Um, it's also believed the Ancestral Puebloans built roads and even sophisticated irrigation systems to take water from um, the arid North American Southwest's few rivers and then to get the waters of their crops. In this region, um, the ancestral Puebloans built fortifications from uh, dry stone and then from materials like adobe because wood would have been scarce in the uh, arid southwest. Once again, they were adapting their tactics and strategy to the environment. Um, archaeological evidence of warfare and in some cases of cannibalism has been unearthed in this region. Um, most of the evidence is from later, from about the 1100s to 1200s uh, CE. Scholars um, of the region disagree on what caused warfare in the North American Southwest, if this was fighting between Southwestern peoples or um, if it was fighting uh, between Southwestern peoples and peoples from further to the Northeast, from the Great Plains. I think the most plausible um, explanation is that the peoples of the southwest were fighting against peoples from the Great Plains further to the northeast that were um, less in less sedentary, more nomadic societies, and they were attacking the people of the North American southwest. Um, warfare in the southwest and plains, just like it did in the um, Northeast became more um, violent and destructive over time with the introduction of um, various European technologies like gunpowder weapons and horses 
keep in mind that horses are not native to North America, and they were introduced by the Spanish in the 1500s CE. Here's an image of the Mesa Verde settlement in what is now Colorado. As you can see, it's built into a um, the side of a cliff. Um, very strategic location um, in terms of defense for um, the inhabitants of the settlement. Um, it would have been very difficult for an attacking force to um, assault and then defeat the defenders because they would have to scale these cliffs, they would have to negotiate these walls. Um, it would have been more effective for an attacking force to instead lay siege to a settlement like Mesa Verde, which is what we think actually happened. And we think that these sieges may have been what led to um, the instances of cannibalism um, in this region in the North American Southwest as defenders of settlements like Mesa Verde slowly starved to death in the face of uh, attackers possibly from the Great Plains. It's interesting to note um, that in the North American Southwest, construction work, uh, the building of houses and buildings, was actually overseen by women. Um, throughout North American, Native American societies, uh, women often oversaw agriculture. There's Obviously, there's some um, exceptions, but it's interesting to see that in the Southwest, women also oversaw construction of homes, too, which would have allowed um, the males, the men in the society, to uh, put more time and effort into military training. Here is a uh, bird's eye view of the Chaco Ca Canyon settlement. It's not built into a side of a cliff like Mesa Verde settlement is, but it's built on a small hill in a canyon. Um, and it's complete with walls as well. Um, the defenders of Chaco Canyon would have been able to see their enemies coming from far off. But they also, like the Mesa Verde residents, they could have been besieged or even trapped inside of their settlement if the um, a force that was attacking them was large enough and had enough supplies. All of this begs the question, um, who were the people that attacked? the um, North American Southwestern ancestral Puebloan sites. Um, scholars debate this uh, point. Um, I'm of the mind that the uh, people that attacked the ancestral Puebloan sites were probably from the Great Plains and were probably a less sedentary, more nomadic society. Once again, they did not have horses. Um, which would have made their society somewhat different than the, the Great Plains uh, tribes that we're more familiar with from the 1500s of the Common Era and beyond. Um, it's believed that the um, inhabitants of the Great Plains, before the arrival of horses, they still hunted bison, also known as buffalo, but they would have had to have used different uh, tactics and strategies to hunt bison. Um, they couldn't use horses um, to overwhelm the buffalo. They may have instead tricked the buffalo into stampeding off of cliffs, um, at which point they would be injured by their fall off the cliffs and they could be killed more easily by uh, hunters. Uh, here are some examples of uh, weapons used in warfare in the North American Southwest. You can see spear and arrow points um, made from different types of stone are used. We also see there's clubs with um, blades in set that can be used almost like an ax. Um, because there's less water in the North American Southwest and parts of the Great Plains. Um, Native Americans probably did not use canoes to travel uh, as much as uh, the people, the Native American people in the uh, Northeastern woodlands would have. Instead, um, the Native Americans of the Southwest and parts of the Great Plains would have used dogs 
as beasts of burden to uh, haul supplies or to haul weapons, allowing uh, them to move a little bit more easily uh, before the arrival of horses. They would load the dogs up with supplies attached to sticks, which were called travois. And now we'll discuss warfare in the Southeast and in Mesoamerica. So the Southeast and Mesoamerica. Although these regions are geographically disconnected from each other, they actually share some very important commonalities um, in how they approached warfare, which you'll see in a moment. We'll start by talking about the Southeast. The Southeast was sort of a borderland between the Eastern woodlands to the north and uh, Mesoamerica, which was to its southwest. Um, the southeastern peoples, uh, especially the Mississippian people uh, of the Mississippi River Valley, they built large pyramid-like mounds out of earth, and then they built wood and earth fortifications to defend these mounds around which they would build their settlements. Some of these settlements were actually very large, um, much larger than the settlements we would see in the Northeast or in the Southwest. Um, this area has easier winters. Um, it's also much less arid and there's lots of rich soil uh, from these rivers, the, like the Mississippi River, that make agriculture easier and allow for a much larger population. Um, some of the settlements like Cahokia shown here on the right hand side of this slide in what is now uh, Illinois and Missouri may have had as many as 15,000 people um, at its height in the 1200s CE. Uh, very large, very large settlement, really a city. Um, these settlements began to collapse due to warfare uh, between each other um, and for other reasons, possibly disease. Um, might have been a factor as well. These large settlements um, built in river valleys would have been a breeding ground for disease. Some of these diseases, of course, would have spread from Europeans to um, Native Americans. Um, it's believed that uh, peoples like the Mississippians were the ancestors of modern day Native American peoples like the Cherokee Nation. Here are some images of the kind of fortifications built by the Mississippian, specifically the Cahokian people. Um, they would build a pyramid-like earth mound at the center of the settlement, and then they would build walls around it, into which um, inhabitants of the settlement could retreat in the face of an enemy invasion. Um, these mounds at the center of the settlement also would have acted as a sort of city center by which um, the chief of the settlement could address um, his people, as seen here. Um, here's just another image of um, Cahokia's fortifications as they are today. Some observations about southeastern Native American societies. Um, as these societies and settlements became larger, um, the societies would have become a lot more stratified. Um, the warriors in these southeastern societies were usually male. Um, we also think there would have been the emergence of specific warrior and military classes, um, you know, groups of people that dedicated their time to um, serving as, as warriors for their communities. Um, resource surpluses and division of labor brought about by um, the region's agricultural bounties would have allowed these warriors to have more time to focus on their military training. They would not have had to have been as involved in things like agriculture. Uh, once again, agriculture was often overseen by women in many Native American societies. Once again, we see division of labor um, allows for a degree of professionalization um, amongst pre-Columbian militaries. Southeastern societies would have had large underclasses of people. Um, we think that they called these people stinkards um, because they were constantly working and would not have had as much time to uh, bathe themselves. Um, 
And these people, of course, would have uh, provided the labor uh, for the military classes. Uh, we do see examples of human sacrifice and ritual killings in the southeastern society on a larger scale than we would see in places like the northeastern woodlands because these settlements are so much so much larger there's there's more people that can be um, involved in these rituals these rituals of sacrifice um, it's also highly likely that the desire to um, have human sacrifices may have motivated warfare in uh, and amongst southeastern peoples. The Native Americans of the southeast um, may have engaged in warfare for the purpose of captive taking and human sacrifice. Uh, mass graves have been found um, where the skeletal remains of uh, those interred show evidence that they were sacrificed in these mass rich ki ritual killings. Um, to accomplish um, captive taking, the peoples of the uh, southeast in their military expeditions would have used a variety of weapons. Um, they would have had access to things like bows and arrows and uh, throwing spears, but melee weapons would have been a lot more important if a primary goal of your warfare is captive taking. We'll discuss that more in a moment. So the desire to capture um, people for the purpose of sacrifice would have impacted the tactics and strategy of the southeastern Native Americans. Uh, melee weapons like clubs and swords would have been much more important. Um, these clubs and swords, of course, would have been made of various types of stone. Um, these societies did not make uh, metal weapons, although some of them did have basic metalworking. Um, to deal with these, these melee weapons, um, the southeastern societies would have equipped their warriors with armor as well as seen in this image and then this um, rec recreation of an image of a southeastern warrior. This armor would have been made of things like um, animal skins or textiles or pieces of wood. Um, it could have been embroidered as well as seen. Um, in these forearm guards. So what you're seeing is that um, a society's culture will affect the way in which it fights its wars. A trend that we'll discuss throughout this course. And now we'll talk about warfare in Mesoamerica and then we'll turn our attention towards the European military revolution. Mesoamerican indigenous societies were much larger um, than the other societies and settlements we've discussed in this video. Uh, Mesoamerica was much more densely populated. Um, this dense population would have allowed for much bigger settlements, many of which would have been considered cities, and also much more permanent monumental architecture. Um, for example, pyramids, pyramids built out of stone rather than pyramids made from earth. Uh, the largest southeastern Native American settlement, Cahokia, at its greatest point, probably had about 15,000 people. But Tenochtitlan, one of the largest Mesoamerican cities, probably had as many as 200,000 people at its peak before the Spanish conquest. Um, over time, Mesoamerican societies would base their warfare on not only captive taking, but on building empires as well. Um, captives, especially warriors, would be sacrificed, and wars would, would often be fought expressly for the purpose of taking captives, high-level captives, who could be sacrificed. Mesoamerican armies were often larger than those of other regions because of the region's larger population, which would have made things like uh, supply logistics, and branches of service uh, more evident and important in Mesoamerican warfare. There's many 
societies and civilizations in Mesoamerica um, across time, we're going to focus on uh, the Aztecs in this video. The Aztecs are often known as the Mexica. So here are some points about the Aztec society which will affect how they uh, built their militaries and approached warfare. Um, Aztec society was highly stratified with um, underclasses and nobilities and priestly classes. Um, it was more stratified than any of the other Native American societies we've talked about in this video. Um, because of the social stratification, they had the resources to set up basically what were military academies. Um, the best warriors in their society, the Eagle and Jaguar Knights, they went to these military academies and they were basically professional soldiers. Um, Aztec society also had um, lower ranking warriors that just came from everyday Aztec society who did not have nearly as much training as the Eagle and Jaguar Knights. Um, because Aztec warfare was so heavily focused on uh, taking captives, um, melee weapons were preferred, although they used some ranged weapons as well. Um, there was some metalworking in Aztec society, but stone blades, especially those made from obsidian, were preferred. Obsidian, of course, is very hard and very sharp, but it's difficult to work and it's a difficult resource to find. Um, to deal with uh, the warfare in the region, Mesoamerican cities were built with certain types of fortifications, walls, or in some cases they were built um, in the middle of lakes, like Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital, which was built on a series of uh, artificial islands in the middle of a lake. Here are some images of Aztec eagle and jaguar knights. Um, as you can see, they're carrying swords uh, made from wood and obsidian. They also have uh, shields and armor made from a variety of materials. Um, we think they would have used textiles um, that were woven, um, natural materials like animal skins and feathers and wood uh, to make this armor. Um, the armor and equipment of um, the Aztec military is better documented than the, the arms and equipment of some of the other societies we've discussed, uh, mainly because the Spanish came in contact with the Aztecs and went to war against them and described in great detail the arms and equipment uh, the Aztecs used. We also have a lot more archaeological evidence um, of their equipment. And we also have some indigenous sources written down in Mesoamerica. Mesoamerican societies had written languages in the way that other North American Native American societies did not in pre-Columbian times. Rank and file Aztec warriors would have had simpler weapons and would have worn less armor. Some would have had shields and swords, others might have used spears or bows and arrows. They would have had less training and less expensive equipment than their counterparts, uh, the Eagle and Jaguar Knights, who would have been from the upper classes and would have had more money and natural resources. The Aztecs engaged in two types of wars, uh, regular wars in which they focused on uh, defeating their enemies and compelling them to do the will of the Aztec Empire, um, the Clausewitzian definition of war uh, discussed in a previous video, and then flower wars, the goal of which was to capture enemy warriors that could be sacrificed. The more powerful the warrior that was sacrificed, the better the sacrifice would be. And it's believed that flower wars were much more expensive and costly and challenging to uh, take part in than regular wars. Some scholars think that um, a long-standing flower war between the Aztecs and their neighbors, the Tlaxcala, uh, led the Tlaxcala to actually side with the Spanish when the Spanish arrived in Mesoamerica 
in 1519. Now we'll discuss in greater detail the role that human sacrifice played in Mesoamerican, specifically Aztec, warfare and society. Um, the ritual killing of captives was seen in other Native American cultures. Um, we have documentary and archaeological evidence to uh, back this up. Um, but the sacrifice of captives was done on a much larger scale in Mesoamerican society, primarily due to the denser population of the region, among other factors. Um, there's also archaeological evidence of cannibalism um, in Mesoamerica as well, just like in the North American Southwest. Um, warfare with the goal of captive taking for sacrifices was common. Uh, the flower wars mentioned on a previous slide. Um, these wars were very costly and they divided the Mesoamerican societies against each other. And this division, of course, enabled the Spanish conquest of Mexico from 1519 to 1521. If you want more information about Mesoamerican and Aztec society um, and their religious and spiritual beliefs, I will post a link in the description of this video. Here are some images of the kind of weapons that Aztec and Mesoamerican societies would have used in warfare. Um, swords with obsidian blades were common weapons. Um, once again, melee weapons were preferred because they were more useful um, in captive taking. Um, axes and clubs and knives were used as well. Knives, of course, were used in sacrificial uh, rituals. Um, Spears and bows and arrows were also used, but they were somewhat less important in the warfare of Mesoamerican societies. Killing your enemy from a distance is less desirable if the goal of your fighting is to capture enemy warriors. Here's some images of um, Aztec and Mesoamerican armor and shields. Um, this armor was designed to be lightweight so that its wearers could move quickly so they could escape being captured or so they could capture enemies more easily. Um, this armor was made of natural materials, it was not made of metal. And while this armor was good for defending against obsidian swords and against spears and bows and arrows, it was not sufficient uh, protection against uh, steel blades and against bullets uh, used by the Spanish conquistadors. Now we'll discuss the European military revolution that was taking place in the years before, during, and after the European arrival in the Americas. Um, the European military revolution took place from roughly the 1300s to the 1500s uh, CE, although sometimes scholars will debate these dates. Some will say it begins a little bit later, more like the 1400s, and lasts into the 1600s, for example. Um, there were significant uh, tactical, strategic, and technological advancements during the military revolution. Um, on land, the European military revolution saw increased use of gunpowder weapons, especially artillery and small arms, uh, things like bombard cannons, harquebuses, and eventually muskets. Uh, these technologies were developed in Asia, but they were advanced by Europeans. They were made uh, more durable, uh, more deadly, and less expensive by European um, scientists and um, blacksmiths and gunsmiths. Um, Gunpowder weapons would change how Europeans built fortifications. Um, the high profile ca castles built during medieval times were too easy of targets for gunpowder um, artillery. Uh, instead, Europeans would begin building uh, low-profile bastion force, fortresses, which were designed to protect cities, but not to be a massive target for enemy artillery. As far as tactics and strategy goes, uh, infantry and linear tactics would become more important, what we often call close-order drill, marching in formation uh, into, into combat, as can be seen on this slide. This becomes much more common. Uh, 
uh, during the European re military revolution. Um, as seen in a variety of battles, um, one good example is the Battle of Agincourt in October 25th, 1415, in which a smaller force of infantry um, defeated a much larger force of cavalry. Um, cavalry. Cavalry will become less important during the European military revolution. Instead of being the center of um, European countries' battle forces, um, cavalry would be relegated to more of a support role. On sea, there were significant advancements during the military revolution as well. Um, you'll see larger multi-sail ships like caravels and galleons make sea travel much safer and cheaper, um, ushering in the age of discovery. Um, it's also possible that Europeans learn some of these uh, sailing advancements from Asian cultures, and then they expanded upon them and improved them over time. Um, the European re military revolution highlights the importance of technological innovation in uh, warfare. Um, during this period, Europeans also uh, increasingly come to favor decisive battles. Um, decisive battles that will defeat their enemies and compel their enemies to do their will in the uh, Clausewitzian sense of warfare. Um, Europeans' contact with Native Americans would have intensified the ongoing uh, European military revolution, as we'll see at the end of this video. Here's an image of the Battle of Agincourt, October 25th, 1415. In this battle, a English army consisting mostly of infantrymen armed with longbows defeated a French army um, consisting of cavalrymen, including heavily armed knights. The English longbowmen, of course, were using longbows, and they were um, wearing much simpler armor. Um, infantrymen were much cheaper and easier to put into the field of battle. Um, keeping an army of infantrymen was much less costly than keeping an army of cavalry. English forces at the Battle of Agincourt primarily used the longbow. Um, the English longbow was made of yew wood, and it required some skill to operate, but it's much easier to master than other types of uh, arms. It's much easier to learn to be a longbow than it is to learn to be a knight, having to learn how to ride a horse and use a variety of weapons versus learning how to use just a longbow. Um, as mentioned before, longbowmen were uh, cheaper to field than knights or horsemen because you only have to worry about feeding a soldier. You don't have to worry about feeding a soldier and his horse. Not to mention knights often had multiple squires to look, who looked after their horse and their equipment. These squires, of course, would need to be fed as well. So it's much more efficient to use armies of infantry than it is to use armies of knights and cavalry. Um, the longbow also had an effective range of up to 200 yards, um, much better than the crossbow. Um, it also has fewer mechanical problems than the crossbow, although it is somewhat more difficult to use. Um, and longbow use um, for many years can cause bone damage to the user, as attested by the skeletal remains of longbowmen. On the whole, though, it's, a, it's an efficient weapon. It's a highlight of the military revolution as infantry and uh, infantry tactics become the way that Europeans fight their wars. They move away from cavalry. Here is a battle map of the uh, Battle of Agincourt. Uh, as you can see, um, the French forces tried to use their cavalry to surround and cut off the English. But the English longbowmen uh, built fortifications, uh, shown here in these X's, and they uh, were able to repel the French attacks of um, cavalry and infantry. During the European military revolution, the European powers learned to adopt technologies used by their enemies especially seen in the years after the Battle of Constantinople in 1453. 
um, the Ottoman Turkish Empire and Islamic power captured the Byzantine city, European Christian Byzantine city of Constantinople in 1453. Um, for many years, Constantinople had been an essential trade city for Christian Europe. Um, it connected Europe with Asia, specifically with the Silk Road. Um, the Ottoman Empire used new technology like gunpowder weapons, harquebuses, and artillery, cannons called bombards, um, to capture and um, defeat the Byzantine Empire at Constantinople. With the loss of Constantinople, um, Europeans lost their main link to the Silk Road in Asia, uh, leading Europeans to look for a sea route um, to Asia, which helped to start the Age of Discovery, which led to Europe's discovery, or rather, rediscovery of the Americas. If you'd like more information about the Age of Discovery, um, there will be links in the video description. In addition, the loss of Constantinople led many Byzantine philosophers and artists to flee west, uh, intensifying the ongoing European Renaissance, in which the knowledge and discoveries of the ancient Greek and Roman civilizations were being uh, rediscovered and re-emphasized in European culture. Here is a battle map of the Ottoman siege of Constantinople. Um, this is the European side of the city and this is the Turkish or Asian side of the city. Um, for many years the Byzantines had relied on their strong fortress walls around the city as well as their navy to keep the city um, safe from enemy attacks. But the Ottoman Turks using new technology like bombard cannons as well as ingenious tactics like portaging their vessels around um, Byzantine fortifications, allowing them to surround the Byzantine navy and, un and unload troops on the uh, European side of the city, help them defeat the Byzantines and capture Constantinople. The European powers witnessed the Ottoman capture of Constantinople and they learned many new uh, tactics and military technologies from the Ottomans. The Ottomans' use of artillery was particularly important in their uh, strategy and tactics. Um, the Ottoman artillery uh, negated the Byzantines' defensive advantage and their um, large walls. These bombards simply just blasted the walls apart allowing um, Ottoman troops, many of whom were armed with arquebuses, um, early muskets to enter the city and defeat the Byzantine forces. Um, Europeans, once again, witnessing the Ottoman Turks capture of Constantinople, realized they needed to adopt bombards and harquebuses at an increased rate, and they needed to improve this technology for themselves. And that's exactly what they're going to do during the uh, European military revolution, is take these technologies which really got started in Asia and basically improve upon them and make them more um, durable, inexpensive, and uh, effective in combat. Here are some images of Ottoman soldiers. Um, we see the Sipahi cavalrymen um, highlighting the uh, European military revolution the Ottomans used cavalry, but they used it more in a supporting role. Um, Europeans were also beginning to use cavalry in more of a supporting role um, from the 1400s onward. Uh, infantry became much more important to the uh, Ottoman Empire, especially troops like the Janissaries. Uh, the Janissaries, of course, were uh, soldiers uh, raised and trained from a young age. Many of them came from uh, Christian provinces that had been conquered by the Ottoman Turks, and they were um, taught, you know, the Ottoman religion and uh, military tactics and strategy became um, a very important infantry force for the Ottoman Empire. So, once again, we see that uh, cavalry are being de-emphasized, but infantry are becoming more important, and Europeans are going to catch on to this and increase this trend. 
partially as a result of the loss of Constantinople. Um, Europeans began making significant um, evolutions in naval technology from the 1400s onward. Um, the European powers, especially uh, Portugal under Prince Henry the Navigator, began to invest in new naval technologies. Um, some of the most notable technologies that they chose to explore were um, triangular sails, ships with multiple masts. Um, triangular sails and ships with multiple masts um, could be sailed against the wind, uh, what is known as beating or tacking. Um, these developments, of course, allowed Europeans to sail much greater distances. They did not need to rely on oars um, the way they had during um, previous periods in history. Uh, by 1488, they'd sailed around um, Cape of Good Hope in Africa, and by 1492, um, they'd sailed across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, these ships, uh, first caravels, and then larger ships called galleons, would become larger and less expensive over time. They could also be operated with uh, smaller crews, freeing up personnel to act as soldiers instead of sailors. Also, larger sail-powered ships could carry more cargo, including weapons and artillery. Here is a woodcut image of the Portuguese port of Lisbon with galleons and caravels uh, in the harbor waiting to uh, dock and take on and offload goods in the city of Lisbon. An example of the efficacy of um, European naval technology can be seen at the Battle of Lepanto, October 7, 1571. At the Battle of Lepanto, a European alliance known as the Holy League, which was consisting mostly of Spanish, Italian, and Holy Roman uh, navies, defeated an Ottoman Turkish fleet off the coast of Western Greece. Um, both factions, the, the Ottomans and the Holy League, had about the same number of troops and vessels. Um, but the Ottomans were using mostly older, ore-powered galleys. The Europeans, however, were using galleons, which were larger and sail-powered, and they were much more maneuverable, allowing them to carry uh, increased artillery and small arms. Some military historians think that the Europeans may have had twice as many cannons and uh, small arms as the Ottomans. By the 1570s, the Europeans had really fully adopted gunpowder weapons and had made significant um, advantages to these technologies, to which they used uh, to great effect against the Ottomans. As you can see in this image, um, the large galleons are from the Italian states, and they're fighting the uh, Turkish galleys, as you can see by the flags. Um, the Battle of Lepanto proved that the Age of Sail was in full swing by the 1570s um, after a massive uh, European victory over the Ottomans. Um, the Ottoman Empire would still be a threat to the Europeans after the Battle of Lepanto, but they seemed far less in invincible at this point. Um, the Battle of Lepanto would also inspire uh, the writings of uh, people like L Miguel de Cervantes, who was a veteran of the battle. Here is a battle map of the Battle of Lepanto. Um, the European Holy Alliance or Holy League is shown on the left. The Ottomans are shown on the right. Um, the European navies were powered by sails, whereas the Ottomans used ore powered galleys. The wind was coming from the west, um, filling the sails of the European ships, giving them increased speed and maneuverability, uh, which they used to great effect against the Ottomans, along with their superior artillery and small arms. Now we'll finish up this video by discussing the European military revolution and how it affected the Americas. Our case study will be the Spanish conquest of Mexico from 1519 to 1521. Um, the Spanish forces under Hernan Cortes landed in Mesoamerica around Veracruz in February of 1519. Most of Cortes' troops um, were called tercios, uh, meaning one-third in Spanish. Um, 
because this type of soldier was much cheaper to put into battle, to field into battle, than a knight on horseback. Um, most of the Tercios were uh, not professional soldiers who had dedicated their lifetime to military service. They had learned how to fight in close formation and to use weapons in preparation for their landing in Mexico. Once again, highlighting that um, the European military revolution allowed infantrymen um, to be trained much more easily. The Spanish troops used gunpowder weapons, steel arms and armor, and they fought mostly as infantry. They did use some cavalry, but they were in a supporting role. Um, the Spanish would also build small ships called brigantines, seen here in this slide, um, highlighting the naval military revolution. Um, and these brigantines were used to attack Tenochtitlan, the uh, city in the middle of a lake, negating the Aztecs' um, defensive advantage. The military technology and tactics of the Spanish impressed other Mesoamerican peoples, leading many, including the Tlaxcala mentioned previously, to ally with uh, the Europeans against the Aztecs uh, in 1521. Disease also played uh, a major role in the Spanish conquest, um, and disease was certainly the biggest killer during the conquest, um, as was the case with most wars before the 20th century. Here is a map of Cortez's march through um, Aztec territory in Mexico. Um, his troops uh, disembarked at Veracruz in 1519. They traveled to the interior to the capital of Tenochtitlan. Um, there were some interesting diplomatic uh, events that took place, including the kidnapping and uh, death of the Aztec Emperor Montezuma. Um, Cortez and his troops eventually left Nostitlan, and then they went back to the coast, only to return to the city with allies um, when they captured the city in 1521. If you want more information about um, Cortez's relations with the Aztecs and other Mesoamerican peoples, there will be a video in the uh, description. Here is a woodcut of the Spanish Tercios facing off against um, Aztec forces. As you can see, the Aztecs are led by an Eagle Knight. These were the elite, um, the best of the best soldiers in the Aztec society. You can see the Tercios are wearing um, steel armor, which gives them protection against Aztec weapons. They're also armed with uh, harquebuses and crossbows. Here are some additional images of the Spanish fighting the Aztecs. Uh, you can see in the left-hand side a Spanish tercio fighting a eagle knight. The tercio is armed with a sword, which is called a Toledo blade, and he has um, a steel helmet. The Aztec eagle knight has armor as well. Um, Scholars of the Spanish conquest and of Mesoamerican warfare estimate that while the Aztec armor was effective against obsidian blades, it was not effective against steel. Um, you can also see um, Spanish soldiers mounted on horses. Um, most of the Spanish soldiers would have fought on foot, but a few would have used horses in a support role. Uh, almost like how tanks are used in 20th century armed conflicts. Um, horses also had a psychological effect because of their size and their unfamiliarity, um, striking fear into um, their opponents and awe into their allies. In the left hand image on this slide, you can see the Spanish uh, artillerists operating a bombard or cannon against uh, Aztec warriors. On the right, you can see a Spanish tercio fighting alongside indigenous allies against the Aztecs. Um, 
scholarship in recent years is really focused on the importance of uh, the Spanish uh, conquistadors, indigenous allies. Um, but we also need to consider why those indigenous people, like the Tlash Collins, allied themselves with the Spanish. And one of the primary reasons was the power of Spanish military technology. If the Spanish had been weak and not impressive, the Tlash Collins would not have allied themselves uh, with the Spanish against the Aztecs. They would have ignored them or maybe even have gone to war against the Spanish. Here's a scene from the Battle of Tenochtitlan. The Spanish um, initially tried to capture the city, um, marching along a series of bridges or causeways that connected uh, the city of Tenochtitlan with the mainland. But attacking uh, across these causeways was very difficult. It was a natural choke point. Um, it acted as a force multiplier for the Aztecs as well as they were able to basically trap the Spanish and their allies on these causeways. Eventually, the Spanish and their indigenous allies settled on besieging the city, um, surrounding it, cutting off the causeways to try to uh, starve out the Aztec defenders of Tenochtitlan. Um, it's also worth noting that the water of the lake that Tenochtitlan was built on was brackish. It was uh, salty and could not be drunk, could not be uh, drank by people. In terms of tactics and strategy, um, the Spanish preferred to fight decisive battles. They preferred to capture cities and fully defeat their enemies uh, using their gunpowder weapons, steel blades, and then of course um, companion species like horses and attack dogs seen uh, here at right. Um, they also built um, ships called brigantines, which were portable. They were built on the coast, and then they were assembled and put into um, use in the lake that surrounded Tenochtitlan. And of course, these brigantines could carry uh, soldiers armed with harquebuses and with uh, small artillery. The Aztecs continued to focus on um, using swarm tactics to isolate and capture enemy warriors including the Spanish and their indigenous allies. Here you see several Aztec warriors surrounding uh, one Tercio conquistador. Um, but this captive taking strategy was ill suited for defeating the Spanish. Um, and it actually negated the Aztecs significant numerical advantages. They were using multiple warriors to go after one Spanish soldier. But in the face of losing odds, the Aztecs remained reticent to uh, adopt tactics that would have been better suited to defeating the Spanish. Um, unlike the Europeans back in Europe who quickly learned from their enemies how to uh, use new tactics and use new technologies. There is some evidence that uh, the Aztecs would have used captured Toledo blades, captured swords, but there's not really evidence of them building their own cannons, for example. Um, honestly, the Aztecs probably did not have enough time. Um, disease was decimating their ranks. Um, once again, their, their captive-based strategy may have actually um, made disease more of a problem. Um, as, as multiple warriors came into close contact with the Spanish during their battles, they would have caught diseases, which they would have uh, brought back to uh, their settlements at Tenochtitlan. Also, um, when the Aztecs gathered to sacrifice uh, people they had captured, diseases would have spread in those crowds. When studying Native American warfare um, after European contact, what we see is that Native American powers that successfully adopted European military technologies, especially horses and gunpowder weapons, they'll be better able to resist conquest. Here is a battle map of the Spanish capture of Tenochtitlan. As you can see, there's several causeways that join the Aztec city with the mainland. Um, the Spanish tried to cross the causeways and capture the city, um, but this was ineffective. So they decided to instead besiege the city and use their brigantine ships shown here. They also cut off water supply um, 
to Tenochtitlan because um, the lake on which the city was built, the water was brackish. Um, it's not healthy to drink brackish water. And eventually, um, the Aztec forces became so worn down that the Spanish were able to enter and capture the city. So to sum everything up, Native American and European societies had developed unique ways of warfare uh, that were defined by their cultures. Um, Native American warfare was not static. It could and did change over time and by region. Um, European warfare also evolved significantly during the military revolution of the 1300s to the 1500s. Um, Europeans had learned from their enemies, uh, especially the Ottoman Empire, making advancements in both uh, naval and gunpowder weapons technology. And the Europeans developed uh, new strategies and tactics to fit with these new technologies. Um, these technologies and tactics, combined with other factors like diseases and indigenous alliances, allowed the Spanish to defeat the numerically, numerically superior Aztec Empire. Uh, Native Americans that adopted elements of Europe's military technology and strategy would have an easier time fighting against uh, European and indigenous enemies in the future. But we'll discuss Native American use of European weapons and technologies in future videos.